Well, hello there, everybody. Merry Christmas. I hope you had an amazing time with your family over this festive season and that you are looking forward to an awesome new year and have lots of exciting things planned, goals set, and are just looking forward to just a fantastic year next year. Uh, this year, uh, I started the podcast again, as you well know, and I thought it would be a nice way to finish the year by speaking about lessons that I learned from each guest that I spoke to and each episode that I have. So I have uh, 21 lessons that I'm going to speak about now and, you know, what I think a little bit about them as well. And I hope that will just help you think a little bit about, you know, uh, your own life and uh, maybe how you can apply these lessons and stuff. So what I'm going to do is I've done this before, my own episode where I have uh, spoken and uh, recorded audio as well as recorded video. And what I found is that there's, there's kind of nuances to doing both of them at the same time. So in the past, I did them, I did them separately. But what I'm going to do, just I guess in the interest of my, my own time and efficiency, is, is try and do them together. So if you're watching, you're going to notice that I'm actually reading quite a lot because I wrote out pretty much everything that I want to say. And I will uh, try and, I guess, do as well as I can to look up again to to make sure that you, you think I'm engaged and, and speaking to you. Uh, but the I guess the priority is that the, the message that I get across. So if you're watching, bear with me. If you're listening, I hope it comes over well. Uh, so what I've noticed is that um, because of the nuances, uh, when you are trying to record the audio and video at the same time, uh, sometimes you on the audio, uh, and also when you've written things out on the audio, you can sometimes sound a bit robotic. So you have to write things as if you're speaking, and that's an art within itself. Uh, like, I'm totally a rookie at all of this, uh, but uh, this is the only way you get better is by doing these things. So I would like to probably do more of these throughout the year, and uh, this is me just uh, learning, I guess, in real time how to do both of them at the same time. So I really hope you enjoy it. Um, I, uh, like I said, I've learned so much this year from, from guests and, uh, it's really helped me improve my own knowledge and understand, I guess, humans a little bit better. And I just feel absolutely blessed to be able to speak to such amazing people all the time. Just one more thing, which I know like might sound, um, a little bit weird, uh, especially if you're listening every now and then I'm going to take a sip of water because I, you know, your mouth gets dry when you speak. So <laughs> you kind of have to, you have to do your best uh, to um, keep it kind of hydrated. Uh, so, so bear with me. Um, if it sounds too terrible, then I, firstly, I apologize. Secondly, maybe I'll try and edit some of them out, uh, but I also want to keep this, I guess, as natural as possible. And uh, yeah, just, uh, just bear with me on that one. So anyway, here goes my first sip of water. <laughs> so like I said, each episode, I'm blown away basically at how much I learn. I can't necessarily say that these are the biggest lessons that I took uh, because I didn't necessarily at the time write out the lessons from each episode, like after each one. I did it for a few of the episodes and looking back, I should have done it after every single one because it's it's a really like cool process to go through and do. Uh, so some of them I've gone back to now and I've gone, okay, cool. I remember this. Maybe that was, uh, well, that, that's the lesson I remember, but it might not be the biggest lesson, but still a great lesson nevertheless. You know what I mean? Like applying any of these to my life or to your life, I think will will help you next year. That's for sure. So here goes. The first lesson right, was actually from the podcast that Craig and I did together with Boyd Varty. And this was recorded when Craig and I were still doing the podcast together. And it was actually recorded like, I think three years ago, maybe almost four years ago. 
So, uh, so it was a long time ago, but uh, it was a lesson for this year because I only actually ended up launching the podcast this year when I when I relaunched. So, the the lesson is the importance of campfires and storytelling. Now, being from Africa and experiencing many campfires in my time, this was just a great reminder for how great they really are. And sitting like outside with your buddies, looking into the flames, listening to the crackle of the fire, drifting away in a daze and kind of letting your imagination run, then telling stories and jokes and laughing. And most of all, that feeling that you are part of something like special and great is just something amazing about campfires. And if you've experienced them, you'll kind of know what I'm talking about and probably feel what I'm talking about. And also in the podcast, Boyd said something around stories. And he was like, stories are full of code that remind us how people, <laughs> let me do that again. He says, stories are full of code that remind us how to be people. And I was like, ooh, that's pretty deep, right? And it's very true, you know, like for ages, that is how we have passed on traditions and kept our cultures and our values alive, you know, and kept them meaningful and lasting. So I think it's really important to become a good storyteller and it's your ticket to capturing your audience and spreading your message. Okay, lesson two. This was from... Craig and I, we did our last episode together and the lesson, and there's actually maybe a few more than one lesson in this, but it was working on such a meaningful project with a friend provides a richness and deepness that is difficult to describe. Pretty much all good things must come to an end and closure is an important part of any cycle. Working with Craig provided a friendship different to any other I've had because of what we did together. You, you learn so much about each other doing a podcast. And we, we were always very honest with each other and upfront and center. And when it came to like ending the show, it was something that moved us both really deeply uh, we, we had a really engaged listener base. And even after such a long like hiatus of, of not publishing an e episode, we thought it was like absolutely the right thing to do to do a final podcast together to explain actually what happened and why the podcast ended. And I think in anything that you do, right, closing something out is like crucial, right? Closing it out correctly is crucial. And especially when you have an audience, I think it's the respectful thing to do as well. Uh, on any project that you might be working on, be it in life or in business, like closing it out properly is a great and important like opportunity to reflect. So reflect on things like what went well, what could you have done better? Did you achieve what you set out to achieve? And what would you do differently in the future? I can hear my voice like uh, in my mouth, like getting, getting dry. <laughs> so uh, it's quite a, it's quite a funny experience, like talking so much uh, to yourself really. Um, but uh, here it goes, lesson three. This was actually the, I guess you can say the start of season two, which is just me uh, speaking to guests myself. Uh, but the first episode effectively uh, was me just explaining, you know, a bit more about the future of the podcast. And the lesson that I personally took from that, I know this sounds weird, but <laughs> is you find purpose through taking action and doing things. So like for a few years, like when we stopped doing the podcast, which was effectively during the COVID era, uh, I actually like really took my foot off the gas completely. You know, I stopped recording the podcast. I stopped taking on more coaching clients and, I felt a bit purposeless, if I'm truly honest. Um, look, it's not like I wasn't doing anything, right? I, I was actually 
still learning new things. You know, I actually spend a bit of time learning day trading and I, and I did that for quite a while. And I also started learning woodwork and, and I did some really cool things like making beds and cots and, and stuff like that. And I really, really enjoyed using my hands again. And then during that time, my wife also got pregnant. But I think if I'm truly honest, like I kept making the excuse of not doing it, uh, not doing the podcast, um, because I was like trying to understand what was going on in the world, you know, and, and I effectively spent like way too much time on the internet and listening to other people's opinions and sometimes getting dragged down by, by the negativity and kind of like doom, doomsday scenarios. So starting the podcast again was just like a huge reminder that there is purpose in doing purpose in taking action. And you start feeling great when you are providing a service of sorts to people. And you also like emit a different frequency of energy yourself. So that was that lesson. The first guest that I had, excuse me, I'm going to have a sip of water quickly. I can feel that the water is going to run out very, very quickly. <clears throat> I've underestimated my water drinking capabilities. <laughs> so um, the first guest that I had on, on the podcast was Jordan Goldstein. And the lesson was distinguishing between the mind, body, and spirit and understanding their interconnectedness. Now, the mind-body-spirit connection is a topic that has fascinated humans for centuries. Uh, though, you know, we always kind of like wonder which of the mind, the body, or the spirit is the decision maker in, like, for example, taking action to go for a run. And his kind of thoughts are generally the mind thinks and analyzes, the body moves, and the spirit wills. These three parts of us are not separate, but rather interconnected and interdependent. The mind is the rational part of us that analyzes things and makes decisions. The body is the workhorse. The spirit is the part of us that wills things into being. And the spirit also drives us to do things that might seem irrational or against all odds. Excuse me. And it's what gives us the determination to keep going, even when things get tough. So when we understand and embrace this interconnectedness, that's a tough word, isn't it? Interconnectedness. <laughs> we can identify which parts, of, which parts of us are weak and work to strengthen them by engaging in the other parts. And I thought that was a cool way to think about it. So lesson five was from an episode I did with a lady called uh, Janice Barcelo. This was hands down like one of the most eye-opening conversations I think I've ever had. Uh, it's also the only episode I've had removed from, removed from YouTube. Uh, I, I still don't know why exactly they don't necessarily give you, give you the details. Um, I do, however, truly believe in like pretty much everything that she was saying. So the lesson is most people are walking around with trauma from birth that they have no idea about. It seems like large pockets of the medical industry are compromised and controlled, right? Um, however, there seems to be a bit of a renaissance going on at the moment when it comes to health and doing things like the most natural way possible, which I, which I find sort of highly exciting. So she mentioned things like, you know, are you a man who is circumcised? Um, were you told that it was more clean and hygienic? Uh, but, uh, you know, have you actually like been told how they do it? You know, like it's quite scary actually when you, when you hear about how they do these things. So, tying a little baby to a plank of wood and uh, cutting off his foreskin. And apparently like the, the screams that you hear from it are pretty frightening uh, because of the pain. And you're doing this to, you know, sometimes a baby who's, who's a few days old sort of thing. And it's like, that's pretty crazy. Like, were you born by a C-section? Uh, was your mother pumped with uh, all these medicines to 
help, I guess, alleviate the pain or help with speeding up the birth. Uh, these are drugs that, you know, are just crazy strong. And uh, the whole process is is pretty unnatural. So this is just kind of like touching the surface, really. But each of these subjects, uh, together with so many other things related to our births, like totally blew my mind. And I really highly recommend listening to this podcast and finding out um, finding out about your own birth, right? And maybe uh, possible traumas that you're carrying. So, yeah, fascinating, fascinating podcast. Lesson six, this is from Gareth Pickering, uh, is the importance of having deep conversations with your parents. So one of the major things that I've learned from doing the podcast and having conversations with people is that we often don't know much about our close friends and even our relatives and family. Like we, we don't really know much about their lives. It's, it's weird. Like in the majority of cases, we've probably like never really sat down, you know, and asked them specific questions about their childhoods, their upbringings, their parents, tough moments, life-changing decisions. Um, so it's a, it's like something I really encourage people to do. And in the podcast with Gareth, he spoke about having a, a deep conversation, uh, I guess a, a deep question and answer session with his mom and then vice versa. And uh, up until that, that point in their lives, uh, they'd both had quite a high level, uh, high surface level, shall I say, relationship and, and probably never knew a hell of a lot about each other and, and, and made assumptions about each other. But by the sounds of it, after having this conversation with, with his mom, uh, that just literally changed their whole kind of like relationship, which was amazing. So, you know, like how well do you know your parents? How well do they really know you? You know, have you actually sat down and had deep, meaningful and curious conversations about their lives and vice versa. Uh, I think like now is a good chance um, or opportunity to kind of delve into those sort of things with them, you know, and like as children, it's sometimes easy for us to pass judgment. You know, we, we forget that our parents were also once young and, suffered with the same struggles and insecurities and that they also had big dreams and desires like yourself. So go have those conversations. In the podcast, Gareth mentioned there's a guy called Daniel Schmachtenberger and what a name that is, <laughs> Schmachtenberger. I love it. Um, so he has a good starting point and like a structure on how to have these conversations. And I'll put that in the show notes and, and stuff for you to go have a look at. Um, time for a sip of water. One sec. <laughs> so, lesson seven. This was with Dylan Harold, a good friend of mine. The lesson was how your passion and the energy you transmit is infectious. Dylan absolutely loves the country he lives in, which is Portugal. And he has a podcast where he specifically speaks to interesting people that live there. He's also like very smart, I guess, in how he does it because the podcast serves as a kind of trust and relationship builder for a, a property business that him and his family have in, in Portugal. Um, however, I'd just like to focus on, you know, the passion and energy that you give off. Like I'm a big believer that your energy speaks before you do, right? So for Dylan, it was like such a breath of fresh air to hear him talk so passionately and like highly about Portugal. Like he really loves where he lives. He loves the traditions, the values, the culture, the food, the history. He loves the old school way of doing things and the fact that life is slower in Portugal. Or should I say the lifestyle is, is slower in Portugal. Um, but through his passion and his excitement, it, it makes you kind of want to live there, you know, or at least go there on holiday. So I think that's a good lesson for any of us. You know, if you're going to do something, 
put both feet in the water, be excited and passionate about what you are doing. Um, it'll, it'll like greatly impact you and those you're trying to perhaps sell to, convince, or influence. Okay, lesson eight was with a lady, Bronwyn Williams. Fascinating conversation. Uh, the lesson was like how our stated preferences don't follow through with our revealed preferences, right? So I'll explain that a little bit further. So many people say one thing and then do another, right? This is kind of what Bronwyn is saying, but with a little bit of a twist to it, you know? So you might be a, like a negative Nancy and constantly speaking negatively about where you live. However, through your actions, it reveals how you really feel. Okay, so some people are revealed optimists about their countries, and other people are revealed pessimists. Okay, I'm using countries in, as an example here. So you may be a massive negative talker about like where you live, but the reality is you're a revealed optimist because you've bought a property, you own a house in the country, um, you might have started a business, you might have invested in a local business, you're sending your kids to local schools, okay? So you, you talk your country down, but you do the opposite. Do you know what I mean? Um, revealed pessimists will be people who don't purchase property, don't start a business, and instead hedge their bets by taking their money out of the country. Um, you know, another example is like some people will talk negatively about the future and like be doomsday type of people, but they have children, you know, so their stated preference is pessimistic about the future, but their revealed preference is optimistic, you know, as they are more than likely betting on the future being a good place because they've decided to have kids. It's not like you want to bring kids into like this terrible world, you know? You might think it's terrible, but then you obviously deep down inside, there's always that bit of hope, you know what I mean? So it's really interesting. And, and the real difficult part about all of this is for people to accept their revealed preferences, right? So to have that reflected on you can be uncomfortable. Lesson nine was with an ex-colleague of mine, uh, Emma Wright. Uh, so the lesson is the, benef the benefits of being a tenacious go-getter and why we should use your trauma to propel you forward. So Emma grew up in challenging circumstances, uh, which taught her to rely on herself and to be fiercely independent. Um, she obviously suffered from her fair share of trauma growing up, uh, which she chose to use in her favor and develop a, a go-getting mindset and attitude, you know, and ultimately she ended up working as like a trader on the London trading floors. And I think this is an important lesson for all of us. You know, we don't necessarily have a choice which cards we are dealt in life. You know, we can moan and cry about it all we kind of want. You know, if you've been dealt a bad hand, um, and, and many people do. And those people also kind of never really do anything with their lives. However, like the opposite is also true, right? You know, you, you can use your bad hand, your adult, as fuel, as energy, and strive to be better. Uh, you know, be the person who breaks the mold. Never let your bad situation or surroundings determine your destiny. Remember, you have one life. Like just literally give it all you've got and inspire others in the process. Lesson 10. This was with Dr. Heather McKee, who is one of my favorite people to speak to. And the lesson is the four burners theory and being self-aware of your energy. So like, do you ever feel like overwhelmed with the, the sheer amount of tasks that you have on your plate? Um, it, so 
talking about the four burners theory, think about your stove. Uh, you, you have four burners on there or hob, de depending on, on where you're from. You call it different things. Maybe if you're super posh, you have five or six, right? <laughs> but when you're cooking, it, it's kind of difficult to keep all four of those pots boiling at the same time. Um, and, and it can actually be, I guess, quite stressful to monitor them all and keep everything going at the same time. Uh, and often what happens is you end up uh, burning something or overcooking something. And uh, I mean, the analogy is kind of like, you know, juggling too many balls at once and ultimately something drops. So in order to feel like we're balanced in life or feel like we're succeeding in life, uh, we often need to like let go of, of at least two things, you know, in, and in order to be like really successful, you know, maybe you just want to sort of focus at one on one. So don't be afraid to do that. However, this is really hard for some people, uh, especially if you like a, growth-minded, high-performing go-getter. You know, letting go of things is pretty much like one of your biggest challenges. And then the other thing which he spoke about, which is related, is being aware of your energy peaks and troughs, right? So know when your energy is bad and low, but also when your energy is good and high. And develop like a heightened awareness around this. I'll give you an example. So like I try and get most things done in the morning, um, but afternoons I still have fairly decent energy like to be social. So I guess I call it a bit of a social energy. Um, so that means I can do things like record podcasts um, and also not bad reading energy at that time too. Uh, like, But whereas like in the mornings I like to just have that stillness for deep thinking and focus to be creative, uh, to write and to have my coaching sessions. In the evenings, like if I do need to do anything, uh, then it's kind of related to tasks that I can do on autopilot that don't require much thinking. And sometimes it's just around planning what I'm going to do for the next day, you know? So the more you get con conscious of your energy levels and when you best operate, uh, the better for you, you know? You can do things at the right times and therefore get the best results. Okay, 11, lesson 11 was with Don Hickman. And the lesson is the importance of playing hard as an adult. And I, I like, I love this one, right? So if you've got kids, you've you've been reminded about how much time they spend playing, okay? And I, what I truly hope is that you get the chance to join in and play with them as much as possible. You know, and I, and I hope that also reminds you as to sort of how much fun you used to have when you were playing or just how much fun it is playing. And take notice about like how it makes you feel, right? Uh, how it brings back awesome memories of your childhood and how you get thinking of great games to play with your kids. I know that, uh, yes, as a kid, we used to play so many great games outside. And I, I can't wait to like introduce uh, my daughter to those games and, and just know we're in for like a Oh, like a whale of a time. And I'm not sure if she's going to have more fun or if I'm going to have more fun, um, but it's going to be awesome. And she better be ready for some Marco Polo. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so um, the funny thing is like in adulthood, once you actually reach adulthood, um, it kind of feels like we've pretty much had all of the play beaten out of us, right? And that it's not something we we do anymore. Uh, maybe we do kind of play, but the games are a little bit more sophisticated, but they're definitely not the same as the ones uh, we spent in our youth running around outside. Um, so remember what play and games do. They bring you joy 
They make you laugh. They create memories. And you form great connections and bonds uh, with the people that you play games with. Um, it's quite concerning how many parents sit on the sidelines when it comes to uh, your kids. You know, they don't really get involved in playing games that much. They'll sit on the sidelines like scrolling on their phone, which is just like, to me, makes no sense. So Don has actually set up a thing called uh, Dad's Friday Fun Night. And what he does is he either hires out like venues or he's got like this massive backyard and he's, and he's built like jungle gyms and, I don't know, comes up with all these awesome games and he specifically invites dads over on a Friday night and brings their kids to, and he's like, cool, now's our chance as dads to get involved and play with our kids. Let mom have the night off and yeah, let's just kind of get amongst it. So, you know, I really, you know, encourage you to give yourself permission to have fun again like a kid. And it doesn't matter if you have kids or not, but just play, have fun. Lesson 12 was from Corne Kricher. And uh, the lesson was was a really important one. Not necessarily that all of us will go through what he has, but the second part of the lesson uh, is important and relevant to all of us, nevertheless. So the lesson was, fame does not last forever, and you need to remain humble and grounded. So Corner is someone who's quite literally held the most honorable position, arguably, I would say, in South African society as, as a Springbok rugby captain. Uh, he was pretty much a man on speed dial to Nelson Mandela because he was captain at the time Mandela was around, um, or one of the captains, should I say. The, yeah, And the thing is, like, once you retire from professional sports, like, it doesn't matter who you are, like, what level you played, uh, your status quickly dissipates and you just become like a normal civilian, pretty much like the rest of us, you know, and... What I love about Corne is that he managed to never let his position go to his head. And he always remained humble and grounded. I mean, he's the type of guy that's still friends with the guys he went to high school with, which says a lot for somebody that's been in his position in society. Uh, he also said something very interesting, which um, I thought was a great thing for all of us to consider was the process of moving from success to significance. Okay. And basically how I've like interpreted that is that being successful is something you almost do for yourself in life. It's, it's more individualistic. Okay. Whereas significance on the other hand is when you start doing something for others or for the greater good of like the community or humanity, so like, you know, in our lives, like by all means, go out there and be successful and make money and however you might define success, go out and do that because I think that is important. Um, however, once you've achieved that personal success, remember that, you know, you're part of um, something bigger. So try and do something accomplish something um, that's better for the greater good and um, share it with the world. Lesson 13 was with Darren O'Lean and the lesson was taking back your sovereignty and also like questioning and researching everything that you put into and on your body. This was like an absolute fascinating, intriguing, eye-opening conversation. And I'm, I'm pretty surprised that Darren hasn't been cancelled yet by the powers that be, that's for sure, uh, for the book that he wrote called Fatal Conveniences. Uh, I do like that, he, that he's taken the red pill. I think that's uh, red pill, should I say. Uh, that's really, <laughs> really cool actually to hear. So as a society, 
we have become part of this like non-stop global consuming money hungry profit making machine like of an economy and system uh, where I think very little thought seems to go into protecting the human species and the planet we live on. Pretty much almost every product that you are using is causing some sort of harm or damage to you. Uh, a lot of it is toxic chemicals. Um, there's something like 80,000 new chemicals that are introduced to our environment every single year, right? And only a small portion of those are tested, you know, and when they are tested, they are tested individually. They're not tested how they react with each other or how they interact with each other. So we really have no idea, you know, about how bad they are. And it feels like we, we're quite literally part of this almost social experiment, I would say. You know, you'd notice things like cancers and other diseases are skyrocketing. And while they make it probably almost impossible to measure or find a direct correlation to, to these products and things that we use and eat and consume, um, pretty much anyone with a bit of common sense can, you know, figure out that that is at least part of the problem. You know, so the important thing is to become conscious of, of the labeling um, and the ingredients of everything that you use and, and, and try to make smarter and healthier choices like where and when you can. Water time. My water is almost finished. Oh, my water is finished. That sucks. <laughs> so um, I am going to actually go and get some more water quickly. All right, I'm back. Uh, my water is full. Thanks for waiting. <laughs> uh, the lesson 14 is from a girl called Gabba. And the lesson is how disconnected we have become from nature and forgotten how to raise and grow our own food. So something popping up into my mind for a few years is like how reliant humans have become on the system, like and supermarkets, you know, in terms of food and stuff. Uh, we live in a world where everything is like highly centralized and it's not necessarily, you know, a healthy existence. Gabba is like an ex-city slicker, uh, but she's become a homesteader and lives on her own like huge farm. Uh, she raises her own animals and, and grows a lot of her own produce and anything that she can't do or make herself, uh, she gets from surrounding farms. And she pretty much does this single-handedly um, while also running her online business. And I think it's quite phenomenal, inspiring, hearing everything that she does and everything that she has learned uh, about her little ecosystem of like plants and animals. And while this might not necessarily be possible for everybody, uh, you know, they, we can all do our little bits. You know, there's a, there's a nice renaissance going on around uh, farmers markets, I think around the world. And, you know, just going to go visit those, uh, buy your food and produce from them uh, is a start. Uh, there's also like some pretty ingenious uh, engineering uh, feats uh, and designs, you know, things like vertical uh, gardens and stuff, uh, which you can even have in your own houses, uh, which will allow people to just sort of start experimenting, you know, and dabbling in growing some of their own produce. I think that's a very cool thing to do. Um, if we all started doing a little more and became more conscious of our purchases and where we spend our money, uh, we could quite easily bring in this mini revolution, I think, by creating a more decentralized way of operating and consuming and taking responsibility and accountability for our own lives and what we do and what we put into our body. Lesson 15 is Ryan Howell, uh, old school buddy of mine. Love, love chatting to the guy. The lesson was accepting the impermanence of everything. I personally don't think that people think about time enough, right? Our time on this planet is short. Uh, it's literally the one thing 
that is running out from the moment your little head pops out at birth. And I read the read a quote, and I know it sounds a little bit somber, but I was like, we are all dying just at different speeds. So just remember that absolutely everything in life is, sorry, absolutely nothing in life is permanent. Everything that you do has a shelf life, including you. You have an expiry date. Nothing is for certain, you know. Everything is in constant flux. And the only thing that is permanent and guaranteed is change. Uh, the cool thing, though, is humans are actually designed for change, right? Physiologically, metaphysically, you're created for change. Your, your body is designed for that. So embrace it. Enjoy it. Don't fear it. Uh, life is happening for you, not to you. Just give it your best crack, you know. Always remind yourself that nothing lasts forever. And that should really be the greatest motivation you ever need to living a fulfilling and purposeful life. Lesson 16 was with Oscar Chalupski. The lesson is there is absolutely no point in worrying. Oscar is this pretty phenomenal person. He's had great success in, in his sports, uh, which is sea kayaking. And the thing that I think that separates him from everybody else is his rock solid mindset. He's also living with uh, terminal cancer, so to speak. He's been living with it for six years. Uh, he was given six months to live six years ago and he's, he's still here and he's um, just a machine of a man. But the one thing that, like I said, he, he says there's no point in worrying, right? So, so run yourself a little worry experiment and, 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 and do this. Go, go into the bathroom, okay? Sit down um, and take all your worries with you in, in the bathroom. Take them in there. And it's just you. Lock the door. Then sit down and worry like crazy, Okay, and see if you change anything in the world or anything in your life. <laughs> and and the reality is like nothing changes, you know. Nothing happens when you worry like crazy. So why even worry at all? And I was like, hmm, I dig that. That's very cool. <laughs> Lesson 17. This was with Tony Enderley. You can do anything you put your mind to. Now, Tony's like this normal bloke, right? Uh, he has, however, like completed like Herculean feats. He's an extreme ocean swimming athlete. Uh, he's, had, he's swum some of the most treacherous long distance swims out there. And the thing that separates him from other normal people like you and me is his mindset, his tenacity, his grit and self-belief in his own capabilities. Uh, he'll even say he's not the most naturally gifted swimmer out there, but the edge and his edge comes from his understanding and belief that he is part of something much greater than himself. And that is what like drives him to push the physical boundaries. Uh, I truly believe, seriously, that each of you is way more strong and capable than you could ever like imagine. I've always believed that. And you just need to give yourself the opportunity to find something tough to do and learn how much you can push yourself. Like your mind is the strongest and weakest thing that you have, right? But if you get control of it, yeah, you can do anything. And your body is this like physical machine, like you can push that thing a lot more than you could ever possibly imagine, like if you have the right mindset. Lesson 18 is with uh, Darren Eggleton, who's this amazing artist and uh, old high school buddy of mine. And the lesson is treat your talent as a daily commitment. 
So even if you have like immense talent, right? You need to treat your talent like a job. You need to show up with like daily commitments to hone your skills. Uh, and many people that I find that are super talented, like effectively rest on their laurels, right? And, and they, they ultimately fall short because they're not putting in the work. And someone who is a hard worker can quite easily trump somebody that is uh, like highly talented because they are prepared to put in that effort and go that extra yard. Uh, tied in with that, like Darren said, is like ho working hard defines your ambition. And I thought that was like an interesting take. And how I interpreted that was basically that when you work hard at something, you are going to probably unlock certain things that you might never have known if you didn't put in the hard work. So that's a cool reason to work hard. And to finish it off, he states, you've got to have the desire to do something that not everyone is going to believe in. You've got to be able to pursue it no matter what anyone says. To become an artist, you've got to really believe in what you're doing in order for other people to believe in it as well. Lesson 19. This is with Stephen Murray, good friend of mine as well. Fantastic guy. Uh, the lesson is be authentically unprofessional. And I love this one. Many people are playing a game when it comes to trying to be successful in the corporate world. Uh, they put on this kind of facade and pretend to be someone they're not. Uh, they pretend to be more knowledgeable than they actually are, more qualified than they actually are. And what they don't realize is that they will ultimately get found out if they carry on this way. You know, people are not stupid, let's be honest. Uh, so rather be like your authentic self. Use your quirkiness, your weird takes, your honesty, your humor, or whatever comes like naturally to you. Um, people are going to vibrate and relate to you much easier when you are your genuine self. You know, and I think the result being that you will likely achieve greater success by simply being yourself. 20. This was, was, this was with Chris Becher. And the lesson is comfort is a gateway to dependency. Again, coming back to hard things, like why is it important to do hard things? And I think it's because we don't really see it in normal life anymore. You know, comfort and complacency is almost rewarded these days and it's not helping people. You know, it's leading to tremendous amounts of stress and anxiety because people are lacking purpose. You know, we're generally going through the motions at work, school or whatever or wherever it is. And we come home and we basically load up on cheap dopamine, you know, whether it's food or Netflix or watching sports on TV or aimlessly scrolling on social media. And doing those sort of things is like no intent behind them, you know, and that just leads to this feeling of emptiness. So, you know, you can see like how in six months to a year of going through the motions and then boom, like all of a sudden in inverted commas, uh, you put on 20 kilograms, right? So now you're all of a sudden again in inverted commas, uh, you're on medication that you're going to have to be on for the rest of your life because you have diabetes or high cholesterol or high anxiety. So the comfort scenario steals your self-belief and it's only going to fuel the desire to just keep seeking more and more comfort and put yourself in a position where it becomes totally miserable. So that's why it's important to seek discomfort, right? If you're not choosing discomfort in some capacity, then that can quickly spiral and lead to a very purposeless life. You know, it's important to lead into discomfort 
and to keep challenging ourselves in some capacity. Remember, if you do hard things, it will flow into other parts of your life. And you'll probably excel at things you never possibly imagined. Right? In your relationships, you'll be a nicer person to be around because you're more energetic and more confident. You know, things like waking up early to do some exercise is going to change your outlook on life completely. Losing weight is going to improve your confidence. Stopping drinking is going to improve your clarity. So remember that growth always happens at the edge of the zones and you're only going to get to the edge of the zones if you seek discomfort. Okay, last one. Here we go. Number 21, Eddie Chanaloshi. <laughs> it's funny, when we did the podcast, I was like, oh, I'm glad I only ever have to say your surname once and here I've had to say it again and I hope I've pronounced it correctly. <laughs> but anyway, lesson 21 is meditate on your desired life. So your life should be lived by design, not by default. 99% of people will begin next year with zero plan, right? They just head down, stuck in the rat race and will pretty much continue their lives that way. And the sad reality is that, like I said, 99% of people don't plan their lives, their days, their weeks, their months, their years, you know, and it, it means you have like no vision. Uh, you have nothing to aspire to. You have nothing to focus on. Uh, so if you want to change your life, maybe start by changing your day you know meditation is one of those things which i think people give up way too easily uh so you know in this scenario now like imagine you have a vision of what you want your life to look like uh, imagine you have like a solid plan of how you want to your life to look to work and how it feels okay and then meditate on that. That gives your meditation some purpose. And you'll sit through your sessions. So each day maybe find 10 to 15 minutes in silence and, and ponder everything that you've envisioned. Um, think how that feels like, how that life feels like. Uh, think what that life looks like. Uh, think about how great it makes you feel. Think about the opportunities that exist around the corner. Think about how unstoppable you're going to be. Think about the epic changes you're going to experience. And think about future you and how proud and thankful they're going to be. So those are the lessons, right? This is just one of probably hundreds of blueprints um, to give your life uh, a bit more meaning, and, um, you know, just I hope that you make the most of, of your life and opportunity on this planet and that you allow the world to share in and experience your magic. So those are the lessons. I hope you enjoyed them. Thanks again to everybody for your continued support. I cherish it. I'm super grateful that you take the time out of your days to listen and i just wish you like the most awesome 2024 let's take it by the horns let's make the most of it and sending lots of love cheers